Today, we will learn and reflect on what it was like to live in the ancient world versus the modern world. And we will reflect on how the ancient world differed from the modern world with regards to medicine, life expectancy, wild beasts, technology, clothing, housing, concubines, entertaining, and printing. And how this should affect our interpretations of the classics and the scriptures passed down to us from the ancient world. And we will discuss what differs in the core of the ancient societies versus the modern societies, how ancient cultures were warrior cultures, how slaves were the employees of the ancient world, the growth of democracy in ancient Greece, and how a more equitable system of justice evolved with democracy in the ever-maturing Judeo-Christian tradition. Now, when you see the Do Not Slander label on the video, you might ask, what does this video on the ordinary life of the ancient people have to do with the commandment, Thou shalt not bear false witness against your neighbor? And the answer is very simple. Although this commandment definitely applies to our daily lives, it especially applies to our testimony when we accuse our neighbor demanding justice, whether just in an argument or in a judicial procedure. And the historical context from the ancient world is that in ancient times, Eyewitness testimony was usually the only evidence available or even admissible. At the end of our talk, we will discuss the sources we use for this video. Please feel free to follow along in our PowerPoint scripts posted to SlideShare. Please, we welcome interesting questions in the comments. Let us learn and reflect together. The ancient world is very different from our modern world. We in the modern world view life as sacred, and we expect our children to survive until old age because modern medicine ensures a long, healthy life to most of us. Now, in contrast, many people died of high fever in the ancient world, fever that we bring down with aspirin. Aspirin alone has greatly increased our life expectancy. If I had lived in the ancient world, I would have died as a teenager from appendicitis. In the ancient world, parents often did not name their children until they were a few weeks old due to the high infant mortality rate. Only half of children survived to adulthood. Some scholars estimate that only one in two youngsters survived to a ripe old age. However, if an ancient child survived to his late teens, he had a decent chance of living to 50 years old or older. And one prime example is Socrates, who was healthy and argumentative at the age of 70. The ancient and medieval societies were helpless to defend themselves against the onslaught of disease and plague. This painting shows the tremendous suffering caused by the Black Death that resulted in hundreds of millions of deaths in Europe in the 14th century and following centuries. In the early years of the Black Death, mortality rates ranged from 30% to 70%, depending on exactly what country you're talking about. Now, when people in the modern world pass away, they often die in the hospital. When people in the ancient world passed away, they often died in their homes. And the sanctity of human life is more evident to modern people than it was to ancient people, literally because people in the ancient world encountered death in their daily lives far more often than we do today. Professor Philip Carey of the Teaching Company posits that the anxieties of the ancient and modern worlds differ greatly. The ancient world was a wild and savage place without the security we take for granted. The anxieties of the ancient people are not our anxieties. Few in the ancient world lived in cities or towns. Many lived in the forests and fields, and the wolves and lions hid in the forests, and they could rip apart your livestock and sometimes your children. Herodotus tells us that there were lions in some regions of the Greek world, and scholars have recently confirmed that. And the name King Leonidas of Sparta means descendant of lions. And as you can see, Dr. Wikipedia tells us in his article on lions in Europe, proof that the ancient Mycenaean Greek warriors hunted lions in Greece. And they may very well have been responsible for the extinction of lions in mainland Greece. This explains why the virtuous pagans sought to control their passions. Their anxiety was that they feared that their wild passions could drag them down to the level of the beasts in the fields. We who live in the modern world have quite an opposite anxiety. We live in cities. Our lives are organized by clocks and computers and cars. And we only see wild animals in the zoo. We do not fear our passions, and instead we seek to be passionate. Our modern anxiety is we will become like the machines that rule our lives. We fear that we too will become a Borg, as almost happened to Captain Picard in Star Trek, 
or becoming an android like Data. Although, to be truthful, we're not as threatened by the chirping R2-D2 and C-3PO. And uh, the ancient world was a wild and savage place also because it was a warrior society. In many ways it resembled the society of the American Indians more than the modern American society. Although those who lived in the Roman Empire at the time of Christ and beyond could live in relative safety, before then the ancients lived in a world of perpetual warfare where at any time your city could be captured in war, and you, that meant that your men were slain or sentenced to work to death in the mines, while the women and children were enslaved. And we examined this in several of our other videos and blogs, and we also examined the brutal fact that women and girls were often forced to be concubines when they were enslaved when their city was conquered. The ancient world was a very different place from the modern world also because there were no employees in the ancient world. Those who worked were either farmers or independent tradesmen, or they were slaves. And these slaves could either do menial work, but it was also not unusual to hire slaves as craftsmen, teachers, or even managers. As Christianity spread through the Roman Empire and became the state religion, slavery was tolerated less and less, and it gradually evolved into a system of serfdom where peasants were tied to the land, but were no longer chattel slaves and both slaves and serfs were often abused, as low-paid workers today are often abused and impoverished. And we also have a hard time putting ourselves in the shoes of the ancients. We forget how thoroughly the inventions and social changes made possible by the Industrial Revolution have so thoroughly changed both our lives and mindsets. The science that makes technology possible robs us of the awe and wonderment that the ancients felt when confronted by the forces of nature. The ancients thought weather was caused by the thunderbolts hurled by Zeus. Indeed, the accusation by Aristophanes that Socrates believed that the weather had natural causes, that Socrates did not believe that the gods caused the weather, may have been a factor in the trial and execution of Socrates, where he was accused of religious impiety, and we examined that in several of our videos. Even the poorest among us today can have a closet full of clothes. Our used clothes fill landfills, and even aborigines in deepest Africa wear Michael Jordan jerseys. This was not true in the ancient world, and the Bible bids us to feed and clothe the poor. And both of these were just as difficult before the days of factories. Have you noticed how many fairy tales feature the spinning wheel? Nearly all ancient women spun yarn from wool and flax and used looms to weave coarse cloth. Women spinning and weaving cloth was so common that even goddesses in the Odyssey had spinning wheels. And most people owned only one or two or maybe three changes of clothes. We are puzzled when the young St. Francis becomes estranged from his cloth merchant father when he sells a few bolts of cloth to buy building materials to repair some rundown chapters. But perhaps these bolts of cloth were as expensive as a good used car is today. And now to talk about the typical ancient houses. The typical early Old Testament house had two stories with a roof. The first floor often had stables and work areas. Perhaps you relieved yourself at night in the stables and the living quarters were on the second floor. And you could also sleep on the smooth flat roof in the summer when it was cooler. And the Mosaic Law requires you to build a parapet around the edges of the roof so nobody can fall off while they're sleeping. And sometimes on hot summer days, people bathed on the roof as did Bathsheba future queen to King David. These Old Testament houses were somewhat like the early Greek houses, and the women's quarters were in the rear and in the second floor, and these innermost parts of the second floor were away from the street. And this was the layout for the Palace of Ithaca in the Odyssey. When there were windows, they were usually small. Often the first floor was locked with wooden keys. And in the ancient Greek houses, the symposia, or drinking parties, were on the first floor near the street. And the men would often invite girls who played the flute and had other talents. But the wives were not welcome at these drinking parties. And now to discuss the major part of this topic, justice in the ancient world. When someone attacks us or tries to steal something from us, what do we do? We call the police. We file a police report. The police look for evidence, maybe dusting for fingerprints or maybe reviewing recordings from security cameras. And sometimes the police capture and go pick up the bad guys. They go to trial, and if they are guilty, they go to prison or pay a fine or both. Now, this has only been totally possible for the past few hundred years. For most of recorded history, there were no professional policemen. There were jails, but no prisons. 
and there were no well-developed court systems available to all citizens, and forensic evidence was made possible by modern science. And the commandment, do not bear false witness against your neighbor, reflects this reality. Eyewitness testimony was the only evidence available. Your reputation was your only defense. In ancient Athenian trials, there was no evidence presented other than the testimony of witnesses and the defendants and their accusers. Now, in ancient Israel was different. If you had a complaint with someone in ancient Israel, you could bring it up to the elders in the community. But usually you were on your own to seek revenge. Now, the ancient Greeks were the first to build a rudimentary judicial system, and serious offenses became a crime against the state to control the chaos caused by these revenge feuds. In the 7th century BC, the Athenian aristocrat Draco was appointed archon with dictatorial powers to draft the first Athenian legal code. His laws had harsh penalties. Nearly all crimes were punishable by death. But what other choices were there? You could not sentence people to prison for years or for life. There was no room in the jails for this to be a common sentence. So your choice of punishment was death, exile, or fines. And someone asked Draco why most crimes carried the death penalty, and he replied that uh, petty crimes deserved the death penalty, so he could not find a heavier penalty for more serious offenses. And we still remember Draco when we say that punishment is draconian. The ancient Athenian jury and justice system also developed hand in glove with democracy, starting with Draco and the lawgiver Solon, whom we cover in a separate video and blog. An important manuscript that was originally a study by a student of Aristotle titled The Athenian Constitution it was discovered in the later 19th century, and it provides many of the details of the Athenian judicial system. In ancient Israel and many other societies, the elders were the judges, and often there were no juries. But in ancient Athens, there were public juries, and but no judges. Also in Athens, there were no lawyers. Although if you were wealthy, you could pay someone to write you a speech for your trial, but they couldn't deliver the speech for you. In Athens, there were also no prosecutors or police, which meant that you had to apprehend the guilty party you were planning to sue yourself. Though if you or your friends were insufficiently burly to force them to appear, you could appeal for a magistrate to arrest and detain them. Any citizen could pose as a prosecutor and bring charges, but they were fined if fewer than 20% of the jurors voted to convict. And also there was a steep fine for a wrongful arrest. And the Athenian jury system was very different from modern juries. Juries were assigned randomly to cases on the day of the trial, and juries were huge, with 201 or 501 jurors depending on the seriousness of the case. This made it impossible to bribe jurors. Jurors were paid at working man's wages rather than the token jury pay in today's U.S. Jurors were volunteers. One of the plays by Aristophanes had a chorus of wasps who were old retired men who liked to serve on juries. Since Athenian women did not participate in public life, women did not serve on the juries, nor could they bring charges. If a defendant was a woman, she was compelled to have a male relative represent her in court, for women could not speak in court. All jury trials were decided in the same day. The water clock determined how long each side had to present his case. If witnesses were questioned or other procedural matters were decided, the water clock was temporarily stopped. There was no rules on what could or could not be said in the speeches by the defendants and the accusers. Cross-examination was permitted until the 370s BC, and after that it was banned. When the speeches were done, the jury voted immediately by secret ballot. There was no deliberation. If the defendant was found guilty, then another short trial was held to determine the sentence. With the accusers suggesting a harsh sentence, and the defendant suggesting a lighter sentence, and the jury immediately voted on which sentence to impose. Athenians could appeal administrative decisions made by magistrates to a jury. But once a jury voted their decision, there was no appeal. There was no provision for a retrial. It was rare for a jury to sentence someone to death. Socrates was an exception. Fines were common, and exile was less common. The Roman judicial system was more professional. Although there were juries, they were not as powerful, and there were judges adjudicating the cases. And we know there were attorneys in Rome, as we read that Cicero started his career by making speeches in legal cases. And in contrast, in ancient Israel, we read in the Talmud that there were no juries. Elders were selected to serve as jurists, three for civil cases, 21 for criminal cases, all those this varied from time to time. Also in the New Testament, why did Jesus exhort us to visit those in jail? 
simply because jails in the ancient world were meant to be temporary holding cells, and if their families and friends did not bring them meals, they might just starve. Perhaps you had to bring them water to drink as well. There was no concept of habeas corpus. The requirement that you could not imprison someone without charging them with a crime was unknown in the ancient world. Dr. Wikipedia informs us that habeas corpus first originated in England in the 14th century. So, though it was rare to be jailed, if you were so unlucky to anger the monarch or local governor, your loved ones might be stuck feeding you in jail for many years with no prospect of a trial or release, or perhaps until the king died. And we have some examples from ancient literature of life in the ancient world. Odysseus recalls how his crew did the Viking thing in the beginning of the Odyssey, raiding coastal villages for booty and women. But they received some justice when they lingered too long and men from the surrounding towns attacked them. Also, Odysseus' wife Penelope waited for more than a decade for her husband to return home from the Trojan War. And in the Greek culture, widows were expected to remarry when they had an estate. Penelope had to endure the stay of over a hundred local suitors in the story who threatened to consume her estate while she entertained them. And although she was technically a queen, without her king present, she had no legal redress. Her son Tamalicus could only call a meeting of the elders who did nothing. When Odysseus returned, he was forced into a Clint Eastwood standoff, slaying over a hundred suitors with only him, his son Telemachus, the goddess Athena, and a few loyal servants. And this sounds harsh, but what else could he do? There were no police, there were no courts, there were no prisons. He was the king, and his warriors had all died on the way home. Then the fathers of the slain suitors in the Odyssey then put on their armor to seek revenge for the slaying of their sons. And the endless cycle of revenge killings was only ended by the direct intervention of the goddess Athena, or so the story goes. We have a clearer picture of how the Greek judicial system worked from around the time of Socrates, and we have a rather complete account of Socrates' trial and sentencing, and one of the Platonic dialogues includes his short stay in jail waiting for the time of his execution, where his friends stayed with him for most of the day. In the Athenian democracy, since all citizens served in the military, all citizens could vote. In capital cases like those of Socrates had 501 jurors. And in the Old Testament, we read that Joseph and those unfortunate servants who irritated Pharaoh could spend years in jail. There was no appeal. They could be forgotten and left in the dungeons for many years. And we can surmise from these comments that perhaps prisoners in Egypt may have been treated better than usual, as they must have been fed by the state. In addition to the references we have of Socrates in Athenian jails, we also have references of St. Peter's and Paul's in Roman jails. And these ancient jails allowed visitors to stay for extended periods, much like visitors in hospitals. Likewise, in the second generation of the Apostolic Church Fathers, we read how St. Ignatius was able to receive visitors for extended stays and was even permitted to draft epistles to the local churches while being imprisoned in jails while en route to Rome with his Roman captors. How did the ancient world remember history? The ancient world had no printing presses. All literary works had to be laboriously copied by hand onto papyrus in ancient Greece and Rome, and in the Middle Ages onto expensive vellum sheets made from animal skins. And the ancients often had to memorize texts that they read or heard once if they wanted to refer to them again. And oral tradition was much more important than it is today. We in the modern world trust most the latest discoveries, since science is always challenging yesterday's assumptions. But this was not true in ancient cultures. The ancients treasure tradition and long settled authority. Also, the ancient world defined intelligence differently than we do. In the ancient world, uh, the true geniuses were the ones who had the photographic memory. Also, the ancient world had very few opportunities for entertainment. For example, most of the theatrical productions in ancient Greece were held during the religious festivals, which were held many times during the year somewhere, but not every weekend. In Rome, there were frequent gladiatorial contests, but as Christianity increased its influence, they were replaced more and more by chariot race. And I must, uh, and I must emphasize, there were no news outlets. This makes it easier to understand why the ancient Christian congregations could listen to St. Augustine and St. John Chrysostom preach for hours at a time during the liturgy, which lasted for a good part of the day. And we may be puzzled at the complaints of these saints, although they're rather feeble complaints, at how much their parishioners shouted and applauded their sermons. 
and these weekly church services were an important part of the week. That was when you could also socialize with your friends, listen to sermons, and no doubt catch up on what was happening in town. And we have this icon of St. John Chrysostom. He's criticizing the Empress Eudoxia for her worldly excesses in one of his sermons, which caused much controversy and chatter, and she caused him to be exiled to the Black Sea, where he passed away. And writers in the ancient world just could not record history with the precision we do today. They had a much different view of the world than we do today. And this is excellently expressed by this author. For the people of the biblical world, history as we understand it was almost meaningless. For them, uninterrupted facts did not help them to understand who they were. Consequently, the two most common genres in the Bible are the story and law, not history. But biblical stories are not lies or propaganda. Storytellers did not just make up the Bible, but they did explain what was going on around them in colorful and artistic language, which we lovers of history must patiently learn to understand and appreciate. History is the genre of what happened, and story is the genre of what does it mean. Now we'll discuss the sources we use for this video. One major source were the videos from the great courses on the other side of history, and the lecture in Athenian democracy on the judicial system of Athens, both by Professor Garland. The long shadow of the ancient Greek world covers the history of Greece from the Dark Ages when literacy was revived through the time of the Greco-Persian Wars and beyond. We found the books on life in biblical Israel and the social world of ancient Israel to be excellent sources with many useful illustrations. And of course, the Iliad and the Odyssey and the histories of Herodotus and their great courses videos are also invaluable resources on the insecure lives lived by ancient Greeks. The YouTube description links to the video script and our blog. Please support our channel by sharing this video with your friends and by clicking on the like and subscribe buttons and by clicking on the Amazon links to purchase any of the books we discussed, which will earn us a small affiliate commission. And please consider becoming a patron of our channel. And please click on the links for interesting videos on other topics that will broaden your knowledge and improve your soul. Thank you.